Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Sheila Mitchell and I am with TABS, the Association of Boarding Schools, and I'm excited to bring a panel of our heads of school to you this evening to talk about their terrific schools all over the US and Canada. And tonight we have um, Jose de, de Jesus, who's the head of school of Lake Forest Academy, which is in Lake Forest, Illinois, which is just 30 miles north of Chicago, which offers an individualized curriculum. One hour west of Boston is Applewild School, a junior boarding school for students grades five through nine in Fitchburg, Massachusetts, and the head of school is, is Amy Jolly. Two hours southeast of Dallas is the Brook Hill School in Bullard, Texas, a Christian day and boarding school, and Rod Fletcher is here with us this evening. Raven Gap Nakuchi School is two hours north of Atlanta in the beautiful Georgia mountains, and their head of school, Jeff Miles, is here with us. And an hour and a half south of Montreal and just one hour north of Vermont is Stansted College, which is led by head of school Mike Wolf. Stansted offers boarding in grades seven through 12. So the way that the flow of this evening will go is that uh, Jose is our host and will introduce all our other heads of school. And then we will jump into questions that our families have. You are welcome to enter a question into the Q&A box below our pictures as well. Some of you have sent in questions with your registration, but do please feel free to post a question as well. And now I'm going to turn it over to Jose for introductions. Thank you very much, Sheila. And uh, wherever you may be uh, in, in this world, I hope you're doing well, that you're healthy and that you're safe. Uh, and it is really terrific to have this time this evening to share with you something about our schools and to also to answer any questions you may have. The goal of this evening really is to allow you the opportunity to connect with us. You can receive some of your questions in advance and we will be receiving questions as we go along. And uh, we are hoping very humbly that we can be helpful to you as you make the decision, the big decision of having to decide uh, the future school for your children. So thank you for joining us on this evening. I am not indeed at the former gardens at Lake Forest Academy. This background is obviously a virtual one but it gives you a sense uh, for the beauty of the place I get to call home. Otherwise, you would have uh, a pretty dire looking bedroom that I'm in right now uh, in my house. Uh, so I hope that the flowers and, and the sun will give you some spirit and make you feel good. Um, and I thought um, we'd start by introducing ourselves, by uh, talking, uh, uh, give, giving ourselves our names, but also a little bit about our schools. Uh, so why don't we go around and uh, I see that Rod is kind of high, high up on my, on my screen. So Rod, why don't you get us going? Thank you, Jose, um, and thank you all for joining us this evening. My name is Rod Fletcher. I'm the head of school at the Brook Hill School, and we are a, a, a day boarding school in East Texas, about halfway between Dallas and Shreveport, about two hours from DFW. Um, we're a Christian Christ-centered college prep school. We have 675 students um, in our school, grades pre-K through 12. Um, but our boarding program is grades 8 through 12 um, with 120 boarding students. Uh, this year we have students from 30 different countries um, in six different states. And that's, that's one third of our entire high school. So um, our school is fairly new. We're 24 years old, but we have pretty much built out the facilities. And so we have a state-of-the-art uh, campus. People call it collegiate quality. Um, our newest buildings are our boarding houses, some of, some of our boarding houses. We now have um, five boarding houses, um, and they are built family style. Um, the parents in the boarding houses don't have any other job except for being boarding parents, and they're fully devoted to the care of the students. We're told that that's one of the trademarks of our school is that they feel very cared for um, by our boarding uh, parents. Um, we're very committed to hands-on learning. We have a world-class uh, Smithsonian quality museum that is a teaching museum. It's a U.S. history museum, and uh, we use that constantly for our students to go down and learn every discipline from the school, actually. We have a fabrication lab um, and an innovation lab, and we spend a lot of time in there creating. And then our, another distinctive is that we have a business school, and uh, in our business school, we have eight different business classes offered, um, which has the ability to also offer um, college credit. Our students can leave us in total with up to 50 hours of college credit graduating from the Brook Hill School. And then in the business lab, they run our coffee house and our spirit store. 
We're also proud of our athletic program um, here in East Texas. Friday Night Lights are a very large part of what we do. Um, at our football games, we have three, four, five thousand people in attendance, um, along with lower school cheerleaders and um, pep squad and all that. So Friday nights are a big deal, and sports are very, very important and very impressive. I'll tell you the um, AJ Minter the other night. You might have seen him at the at the um, National League Championship ser Series pitcher that had the had the seven strikeouts in the first three innings. That's a Brook Hill alum. So um, anyway, we're glad you guys have joined us tonight, and I look forward to telling you more about Brook Hill as the night goes on. Thanks, Rod. Uh, why don't we continue with Amy from Avalon? Hi. I <clears throat> just cruised into my office here. I was just up at our dorm. Uh, every Monday night, I have dinner with the boarders so that our dorm parents can um, get together and have a meeting and connect. And um, our, our program is unique in that we are a junior boarding school. That means we will board grades five through nine. All of our students actually graduate after eighth grade and they have the option to stay for ninth grade. So it's a, a competitive advantage for our students. Um, our ninth grade program is a, a unique one year program and uh, it's, it's, it's called Prospect Studio and it's designed to give students a year of leadership, innovation, design and entrepreneurship skill development. So it's integrated curriculum around urban renewal and placemaking. And the kids call it van school because they actually go out into the field and learn. So I know some of you may be wondering, gosh, uh, fifth grade, that's really young to go to boarding school. And yeah, you know what it is, but I'll tell you uh, from mom to mom that th they're still your children when they're at boarding school. And for example, right after school, they went up and one of the first things they did was they called home and we provide them with a, a wonderful home-like environment in our dorm. Uh, it's a mansion that was built in 1910, fully refurbished last summer. Uh, so everything's just brand spanking new. And it, as um, Sheila mentioned, we're an hour west from Boston, but we're also half an hour from Worcester. So Worcester is the second largest city in New England. So we're sort of conveniently located for everything. And because of our small size, we actually tailor our weekend programming around the interests of our borders. So uh, very, very family oriented, very personal. Um, every Wednesday night, I take one of the students out to our, there's a private dining club down the street and I take them, uh, take them one at a time just to get to know me and so that I can know them. And, and that's how we keep it, uh, you know, part of the Avowile family. So that's my school. I'll look forward to your questions. Thank you, Amy. Keep it going alphabetical. Uh, Jeff, why don't you go next? <laughs> All right. Uh, so my name is Jeff Miles. I'm the uh, the head of school at Raven Gap Nakuchi School, uh, and we are in uh, the beautiful rural area of uh, North Georgia. Um, a lot of lakes uh, surround our campus. We have 1,400 acres, um, and we are a school uh, pre-K through 12. Uh, 630 students overall. Um, 248 boarders seventh grade through 12th grade. So we do have, we are one of those rare schools that have seventh and eighth grade uh, boarding, um, a very small intentional program for our middle school boarding. Um, we are a school 100% go to um, uh, competitive colleges and university throughout the world. Um, and we are one of the most uh, globally diverse schools in the country, um, representing 56 countries and 16 states. Um, so what's Raven Gap known for? Um, you know, I think when we, we look at our original mission uh, dating back to 1903, we were always a school that served the underserved. Um, so we are, I, I would say the inverse of most financial aid models. Um, you know, so 70% 70, 70 of our students receive financial aid um, in some way, shape or form. Um, so that allows us to attract students from, from all over the world, all different backgrounds. Um, I would consider us one of the least elite schools as, as far as that goes. Um, you know, I think we're a school that you don't recognize um, the financial the students that receive financial aid or, or full pay. Um, we we kind of pride ourselves on one community. Um, we have state-of-the-art um, arts uh, facility and program nationally known. Um, we have been a, a top 25 boarding school academically, um, and we um, 
we have a, a thriving athletic program too. Um, so and part of my role uh, as head of school in the last couple of years is to really boost athletics and um, be, be a higher level championship uh, program and, and attracting students from all over the world. So that's a little bit about me. Look forward to your, uh, your questions. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, Mike? Yeah, hi, everybody. My name is Mike Wolf. I'm uh, the head at Stansted College in Stansted, Quebec. I'm in my 16th year as head. I uh, just wanted to thank you, uh, Jose, for hosting and thank Sheila for uh, putting this together. And uh, great to hear about all the schools. I was speaking to Rod before, and I would love to be attending a Friday Night Lights game and see <laughs> all those people there. Um, uh, Stansted College has been around. Uh, Sheila said, don't say this, the first line, but I got to say it's been around for about 150 years. Uh, we are located in Quebec, but we teach in English. Uh, we are the only Canadian school that is accredited by the New England Association of Schools and Colleges. And why is that? Well, primarily it's because we're not located an hour north of Vermont. We're actually located about one minute north of Vermont. We are literally right on the border. In fact, there's a street called Can Usa Street because the south side of the street's the U.S. The north side is in Canada. So Prior to the pandemic, actually, there was a lot of cross-border stuff. Now there's absolutely none. It's very odd. Uh, we're a big campus of 500 acres with only about 250 students. So we divide it up. Each kid gets two, two acres. No, not, not quite. But it's a big campus, beautiful campus, beautiful time of year to be here because uh, we get four seasons. And uh, right now, the leaves are just spectacular. Uh, we're a university prep school. 100% of our grads go on to university. Interestingly, about... 30% of those grads go to universities in uh, the United States. 70% uh, boarding from grades seven and 12. We actually have day students who under normal circumstances cross the border every day from Vermont as day students. We're 50% Canadian, we're 15% uh, US, 35% international like uh, Raven Gap, a lot of uh, not that diverse, but 25 different countries and um, you know, we're operating right now in a very safe bubble. Uh, I can remember somebody asking me, you know, why would somebody put a school out in the middle of nowhere? And uh, actually, this is a great place to be now <laughs> because uh, we haven't had any uh, cases at all. And uh, we're able to conduct business, um, all of our business uh, fairly normally. We're an advanced placement school, so you can qualify for university credits up here. And while we do play three seasons of sports is my last thing. We're a big hockey school. So we don't get uh, 3,000 people on Friday night, but we get a lot of people in our own uh, arena. And uh, we have four hockey teams. Uh, many of our graduates go on to play uh, NCAA hockey. And um, I'm happy to answer any other questions that you may have. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Uh, so, like I said earlier, I'm Jose de Jesus. Um, I am in my second year as head of school at Lake Forest Academy. My first year was not very eventful at all. Uh, nothing much happened anywhere in the world. Um, obviously, I say that with deep sarcasm, being that we're all going through this all collectively together, this period of COVID. And uh, while working on our reopening plan, I came to realize the uniqueness of Lake Forest Academy in many ways because I was looking for like friends and I couldn't find very many. Uh, in terms of the boarding school world, it's been great to connect my TABS friends, but there aren't a lot of schools uh, in Illinois who are, have a boarding component. Uh, we're half boarding, half day approximately, which I love. Uh, some of our students who are boarding uh, get to connect with the local community, which is about, oh, depending on traffic, 45 minutes to an hour north of Chicago. Uh, and then some of our day students, the reason, one of the big reasons why they go to Lake Forest Academy is that you can go to a school uh, in the North Shore of Illinois, of, of North Shore of Chicago, Illinois, that has students from 35 countries and, and 17 states. So it's a very unique experience in that way. And then when it comes to the schools in the Illinois area, and uh, had some great friends amongst the heads of school in my area, uh, very few of them have a boarding component or a residential component. So when I was looking for friends on that level, uh, I did find friends, but not people who had the exact situation we did. So even though during COVID response, there were challenges attached to it because we had a very unique situation at Lake Forest Academy, it also helped me appreciate just the uniqueness of the school. Uh, this is a place where you can go to school with kids from all over the world. 
with kids from nearby. You can have dinner at the home of a, of a local boarder. Uh, it happens all the time and feel that sense of home. Uh, if you're a boarding student and vice versa, if you are a day student, you can have dinner with students from all over the world and even spend a night in the dorm uh, and connect with folks uh, from all over the world. My daughter is a junior and is a day student, uh, obviously being that she's living with me, but being on campus, we lose her several nights to her friends at Field Hall uh, here, in, uh, here at Lake Forest Academy. So, so that I love about the school and it makes it very dynamic and unique. It's a co-ed school. We have about 435 students, ninth through 12th grade. Uh, and about 50-50 boys, girls, slightly more boys than girls, and slightly more day students, about 52-48 than, day, than, than, than um, uh, boarders. Uh, but we love that map balance. We love that mix. We have almost 40% of our students identify as students of color. Uh, and that mixture of, of, of just beautiful humanity is one of the things that I really love about the place and got me to move from my native New York City, 800 miles, uh, carrying my my 16 and 12 year old along uh, with my wife uh, to, 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 to come to this place, this beautiful place. Um, we uh, take a lot of pride in connecting to the world. It's a little hard right now. Uh, it's one of the toughest things that we've experienced is the last two uh, March, you know, last March and this March, we won't be able to travel. Uh, that's a big part of component. Uh, our, 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 our phrase is Midwestern heart and global mind. And uh, the Midwestern heart is coming through in a big way as we navigate this. We're all in person every day right now, which we're very proud of. And a lot of schools in our area aren't doing, but, uh, but the global mind piece is hard because uh, it's, it's been a struggle not being able to get out to the world. Um, we have uh, trips that are both uh, curricular <laughs> trips that are part of tuition where you can go and, and, and explore with your teachers and your, and your classmates um, uh, and go both nationally and internationally. And then we have co-curricular trips that are designed every year and I'd say it's a big component of what we do. Uh, it's bringing the world to Lake Forest, Illinois, but also having our students from Lake Forest take on the world and go all over the world and, and sometimes even locally in terms of our service learning program. So we are uh, a school uh, that is uh, relatively small, but very mighty. Uh, and uh, I, I really, I've been very fortunate to be in a lot of environments and a lot of schools in this world. And uh, I gotta say the student body at Lake Forest Academy uh, really just takes my breath away on a daily basis. So I'm very proud both as a head of school, uh, particularly in this moment of crisis, uh, to have this incredible uh, array of, 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 of people joining uh, our academy, but also as a father, uh, I really just love the way my daughter has blossomed in this setting. So that's Lake Forest Academy. I can go on forever and ever as I'm sure we all can about our schools. And one of the things I love about independent schools is the ability and particularly tab schools, we're all connected tissue of our passion for our students and passion for our for education. But as you can see, not one, of, not one of the schools that just presented are exactly the same. So wishing you all incredible luck and fortune as you, as you find the right fit for your family. So um, with that, let's turn to your questions. And we got a few questions and they're pretty good. And why don't we just address the elephant in the room right away? Uh, and that has to do with essentially what's going on right now for our schools uh, in the context of COVID. Um, so the first question really is, uh, are you all open? Uh, are we open? And if we are open, uh, in what ways are we making adjustments? And being that this is an admissions conversation and people are thinking about joining us, there's another question about, are we changing our admissions process because of COVID? Uh, and the SSAT entrance exam, um, you know, is it required or not? Where are we on, 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 on COVID as a whole, but also when it comes to admissions and COVID, what are we doing in these historic moment and historic circumstances to, to help operate our school and help bring people back to our community? So I'll leave it open to our panelists to, to answer. Well, I'm happy to start or get the ball rolling. Um, so we, we are fully open and operational. Um, as crazy as this sounds, we actually uh, started uh, re-entry July 6th. So we brought 40 students back uh, at a time. We quarantined, tested two weeks later, then they moved into their, um, their permanent room. And then we brought another 40 in, uh, especially having students from 56 countries and 16 states. Uh, the re-entry plan was complicated to say the least. Um, so we were able to do that um, successfully uh, through 248 borders. We had one asymptomatic um, 
student uh, that tested positive for COVID. Um, that student was within our protocols and was quarantined at the time when he got the results. So uh, contact tracing was, was a minimal. Um, we have done spot testing since then, uh, and I'm proud to report we've, we've had zero um, positive cases uh, since that, that time. So um, from July 6th to uh, present day, we're, I guess we're 10 weeks into school. I think this is the start of our 10th week. Um, so all programs are running. Uh, we even have football, uh, which was, I, I guess, somewhat a surprise um, going into the summer, but uh, all sports um, are, are uh, up and operating, our arts program. Uh, we have a Cirque program. I think we're one of the only schools in the country that have a uh, Circus Olay Cirque program. So uh, even that is, is up and running. Um, masks are required on campus for socially distancing. We've spaced out uh, classrooms. We have three different lunch periods. Uh, we're forcing it to have a new dining hall that, that um, can hold 450. So that's been, uh, we're utilizing a lot of outdoor space in our 1400 acres. Um, so we are knock on wood, uh, so far so good, but um, making it work. Uh, as far as admission process, um, as we move forward, uh, somewhat normal, we are doing a lot more virtual tours, obviously, um, uh, and that has been successful. Um, Honestly, we've been able to do a lot more individual catered uh, tours as a result of it, um, and a, as a result of a lot less travel. Um, we are still requiring the SSAT um, unless there's extreme circumstances, uh, but as far as the admission process, somewhat normal. Um, interviews are via Zoom for the most part, but we are, we are doing on-campus tours as well. Um, you know, and, and just doing, doing that uh, safely and, and with uh, social distancing. So, um, so far, so good. Thanks, Jeff. Anyone else want to take on that question? Sure, we're, um, actually, it's pretty interesting because it's a little bit different situation in Canada. I mean, we are open and we have been uh, since just on our uh, early September. Uh, we're fortunate in the week in quarantine. We have quarantine facilities on campus. Uh, the biggest change for us was that um, with the border remaining closed between Canada and the United States, our day students had to make a choice. They could either go online or they could cross the border and we offered them uh, residency and many have taken uh, advantage. We're in person. We're doing it by grade. There are not recommendations, but laws in Canada uh, saying that you have to wear a mask in outdoor public spaces. Um, so we've extended that actually to all of our outdoor areas. The only place you don't have to wear a mask is in your residence room and in your classroom. But we've been COVID free. We haven't had any cases at all. Um, really interesting to hear the Cirque du Soleil because at our uh, Canadian Heads Conference, Cirque du Soleil is a Canadian company and they had the CEO on yesterday based out of Montreal. And he said, uh, you know, in a normal year, they take in $1.1 billion in revenue. And since March, they've taken in zero revenue and have laid off over 5,000 people. So tough times for them. Um, we're doing, as uh, I think everyone, virtual tours. We accept the SSAT, but we do our own admissions test. And uh, so, uh, you know, I think all of us would say the same thing. The best thing is if you could visit the campus. I mean, that's it's got to be a good fit for you. It's got to be a good fit for us, and particularly in small schools like ours, uh, the fit really, really matters. Um, but I think we're doing the best we can online. And uh, I think for parents out there, uh, it's a win-win because th these are all great schools, so you can't make a bad choice. It's just which is the, uh, the best one for you and for your child. So I'll, I'll jump in and just say, similar to Raven Gap, we're we're wide open, um, or we're open, and we're taking some you know safety protocols. But I will also say, in addition to that, East Texas is <laughs> wide open, and so we're we're uh, playing football, full fans, um, you know, everything's pretty much wide open here. Um, we're we're being very careful, quarantining if someone gets COVID. Um, Admissions is going similar, although like everybody else, we're, we're more than happy to do virtual tours. Um, and then we are being flexible on our, our admissions tests because we understand that, um, that that may be a challenge for people to get to take a test. But as far as um, 
doing school, school, school here is very normal and life here is very normal. I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, we're a little more um, buttoned down <laughs> than uh, than you are in Texas. We uh, have got our kids in cohorts, so they're by grade. Um, are in our boarding program, all the children have a single room and they either have their own bathroom or they share with just one other student. Those bathrooms are cleaned daily. Um, you know, within our program, we're running 100% normal program, but we're doing some things a little differently. So, you know, our, our teacher is teaching almost exclusively outside. I saw a group of eighth graders making some amazing sculptures with twigs. Uh, the assignment was make two creatures that are doing something with one another. So really a lot of creativity that's coming out of this. Our band teacher, uh, because we aren't using wind generated instruments, actually has purchased a keyboard for each student and they are playing, the, he's tuned the keyboard to the key of the instrument they're playing. So they're all doing keyboards and we've spaced them all out on the stage. So it's really interesting to see just the amazing innovation that our teachers um, are doing, but we are being very, very careful. Uh, I also purchased um, these really, these really cool uh, air filters that are 40 times better than a HEPA and actually screen for COVID. We've been open since July and we haven't had a single case so uh, <clears throat> working really hard to keep it that way. And you know what, we're gonna get through this. Before we know it, it's gonna be, we'll be post pandemic, um, but it's not gonna happen overnight. So our school is really prepared for the long haul and keeping our students uh, healthy and safe as well as our faculty and staff. Thanks, Amy. And for LFA, I'll just add this, we, we've been open uh, with lots, with some significant restrictions, uh, full day, uh, all, all students. Um, the state of Illinois, as you can probably hear, uh, Texas and Georgia and Canada and Massachusetts, all the states have different um, restrictions. So Illinois has made clear there's certain sports that can be played that can't. We can't play football, for example. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and although we don't have a football team currently, <laughs> but we wouldn't be able to, uh, and, and we're limited. Um, and every state's a little bit different, and we're trying to get as much value as we can from, from what what the areas are that we're allowed to, uh, to engage our students in. Um, in terms of admissions, we are also showing some flexibility. Um, we're doing some virtual tours right now uh, and some fun panels. And we have these Thursday night panels that ha have a certain focal area, focal points. Uh, be sure to check out our website if you're interested. Uh, and every Thursday there's a new uh, panel that, that, that gets presented uh, based usually around a particular interest when they have. Um, we are requiring testing, but we're looking at the SAT. We will consider IC as well uh, and other tests as well. So, you know, it'd be good to touch base with our admissions office if you're interested. So um, I thought we would take some time to not just talk about COVID because I, it's very easy to, to get completely, uh, we could have done a two hour thing just about the experience of COVID and I'd be very curious. Um, but there's a lot of questions really about uh, community and culture that I thought were really compelling. Um, and, uh, and one thing I think that, uh, that really got my attention was this notion of people who are researching boarding school websites for the past few months, and, and they feel like in truth, at least uh, on, on paper, so to speak, uh, that, pe that the school sounds similar. Uh, I, I would love to hear from all of you, even though we've heard some already, what would you say makes your school you know, so unique? Anyone should feel free to take that on. It's a big question, Jose. And I must say, you know, um, every institution, whether it's a, a business, a church, a hospital, you know, it has its unwritten culture. And, you know, we, we never write down truly the things that I think you're asking about. And the way I think about it is above every one of our schools is a cloud. And inside that cloud are the big ideas that drive each one of our institutions. And some of it's tied to mission and some of it's tied to things like core values. but before any of us do our individual jobs at schools, we reach into the cloud and we pull down that big idea. And that's the lens that we look through to do our work. At Applewild, one of those big ideas is metacognition. So because we are a, a junior boarding school and we focus with young children, really 10 to 14, we, we really focus on teaching them how to drive their own brains. So that's helping them think about the content of the material they're learning, but also about um, how they are learning. So they're programming, programming themselves for deeper learning, learning that sticks, and they learn to monitor their work. They learn to reflect on their work. It's very rare at Applewild to see a teacher say, oh, good job, Susie, which you know is natural instinct for all of us, 
But what's really common is to see a teacher say, Susie, you know, tell me what you were doing there. Tell me a little bit more about your work. And what we're trying to do is get the child to internalize their own motivation. We find that that's the best way to prepare them for like for secondary schools, like many of the fine schools on this call. Thanks, Amy. Well, I, th I mean, I think what the go fine, ahead, oh, go ahead. Oh, good, Jeff, go ahead, I'll, I'll follow you. <laughs> um, I mean, I think what defines us, uh, if, I did, um, if I had to define it in one word, would just be global. Um, you know, having students from all over the world uh, and having true diversity and global diversity, you know, especially as, uh, as, as our world uh, pre-pandemic was much more of a global economy. And, and that's, um, that's what we try to educate our students with. Um, we've kind of shifted to an applied learning model curriculum um, and creating partnerships with uh, domestic businesses, global businesses, um, and allowing our students from all over the world to be able to connect um, and, and create more of an, an applied learning uh, model and approach um, in, in creating uh, portfolios that they share with colleges, uh, et cetera. So um, I think you have like the intentional part where you have uh, the curriculum and, um, but you also have the organic aspect where, you know, what I love about our uh, alumnus is when they graduate, um, I mean, there was, there was a handful of students that we had this past um, summer that that were able to travel, uh, you know, and, and see students from all over, over the world um, and, and have different places to stay. And that's, you know, I think that's an important aspect of education too, being able to not just learn about um, uh, culture and um, different areas, but but also be able to live it and, and see different areas and uh, live in different countries, et cetera. I would just, I spoke already earlier a bit about, I won't go too far, far too much further about LFA in terms of um, its location being, I think, really unique, uh, you know, to be uh, less than an hour away from a city like Chicago, which is just an extraordinary city. Um, and then to still have a beautiful campus, as you can see behind me in my, in my uh, virtual background, and then just really have the world come to you in many ways and, and being engaged with the world within the context of being so close to a city like Chicago, you know, it's, it's, a, it's terrific. You know, there aren't a lot of boarding schools even close to major cities. Um, you, it's not something you normally see. So, so that access, I think, is something that is really pretty special. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and you can feel it when you're here. We also have something I, I really admire too. We have a real political diversity. You know, this is not a school you can take, make too many assumptions. We have students who are liberal, we have students who are conservative. You know, we're, we're gonna, we're, we just did a, a mock, a mock uh, election at the school and we'll see the results, but you know, you're gonna see students who are gonna, who are gonna have different perspectives. And one of the things we take deep pride in is the ability to bring people together. How do you build, how do you bridge the, the, the sort of supposed chasms that can exist based on so many different things? And we're, we're having this racial conversation in our country this year and, uh, and to actually have students who have different perspectives on that come together and, and engage with one another has been a real pleasure. So. Not only do we bring folks together, we believe really deeply in, in finding ways to unite and to connect. Uh, and again, that diversity of thought along with that diversity of, of experience and identities is something that uh, I find really interesting and compelling about LFA and, uh, and I really love because it feels, you know, as in the future, we're gonna need more students who can go out into the world and confidently engage with others and have the skill set to, to, uh, to bridge rather than to divide. So uh, that's why I think it makes LFA pretty special. Anyone of my other my other panelists want to join? I'll sure, just, it makes us unique. Um, you know, I, as someone said, that's a tough question because uh, on the one hand, I think uh, the schools that are participating here tonight, I mean, they're all they have a lot of similarities in terms of uh, just high standards for academics, athletics, student life, residential life, uh, and I think everyone can feel confident that uh, those things are going to be guaranteed at uh, going to schools like ours. You know, in our case, uh, we have such a small student population. I think, you know, we sell it as a, a family experience. That would be the word that I would use. And what are families there for? Uh, particularly for teenage kids, they're there to support them and to build confidence. And, uh, you know, that's, um, I, I think, why a lot of the schools have sort of the, uh, the triple threat teachers who teach, who coach, who do residence duty, who 
really build strong, long lasting bonds with students and are able to support kids through the high school experience and, uh, and build confidence. I mean, I'm, that's one of the things that I, I think is most important because all, all high school kids are looking for acceptance and they're uncertain. And uh, if they were uncertain before, imagine how they're feeling in a world like this right now. And I think our role as educators, probably not just inside the classroom, but outside the classroom is to prepare them. Sure. You know, and I think we all do a good job of that, but also to make sure that they can leave with a special kind of confidence and belief in themselves. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure that that's really what we're all, all uh, trying to do with our students. Well, yeah, I would echo um, Mike and say this is a very hard question to answer, especially if you're answering it last, as far as your uniqueness. Um, I really would kind of say a similar thing, though, is that at Brook Hill, um, a community of care is so incredibly important. The way we have um, built and designed our boarding pro program, um, each student feels very cared for. And someone asked earlier about the homesickness even. Um, you know, we have a very low staff student uh, ratio. And so there's just a lot of people caring for, especially the boarding students. Um, but then the other thing I would say is one of the things, you know, I don't know if it's intentionally unique or just part of what we do is our school spirit and our community pride um, is very high. And so our school is really fun. And, you know, with pep rallies and tailgates and again, football games and all the different activities, there's just a lot of people who really, really like going to school here. And it becomes very uh, much a part of the ethos of a student's experience. Thanks, Rod. Now you got me wanting to go see one of the games. So I think we have to do a panel reunion uh, down in Texas. Uh, there was a question that, that you actually referred to, Rod, that I, I found also interesting. Uh, as boarding environments, students come to us from all over the world in some cases, and even sometimes nearby. And the transition can be a challenge. Uh, the first time living alone, usually for a new ninth grader per se, or for in, 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 our, in terms of our junior boarding school and our boarding school that goes to seventh grade, it could be as early as fifth grade, sixth grade, and coming in and, and learning to live away from home. Um, in terms of Rod and his reference to, 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 to homesickness, I want to expand that a little bit. Not only how do we deal with homesickness, but also how do we just deal with the mental health and, and, and the well-being of our students when they are, you know, away from home uh, and away from the things that normally would be a source of that kind of comfort. Uh, what are we doing at schools to, to aid our students as they transition and then grow in our environments? Well, uh, maybe it's my turn to go first. <laughs> I don't want to put all the pressure on you, Jeff, to uh, have to always answer first. Uh, you know, the, uh, there's a sort of a funny story about homesickness. I always tell, always gets a big laugh. I hope it does tonight. And that is, uh, you know, you get parents and they'll say in the first couple of weeks, well, my son or my daughter is really homesick. You know, they're calling, they're emailing all the time. I hear from them every day. What do I do? And so I usually say, well, you know, and it's going to sound a little funny because I say hang until Thanksgiving. And I don't mean American Thanksgiving. I mean, Canadian Thanksgiving, which happens in early October. So I say, give it about a month. And uh, usually what happens after a month, the same parent comes back and say, you know, I never hear my son never emails me, never calls. I never hear from them. So there is a sort of for a lot of kids, a transition phase. And I think everyone would say the same thing. Um, you know, for a lot of students who have not, say, gone to a summer camp, been away from home, Maybe you have been homeschooled and are used to uh, an environment where there aren't a lot of kids around or even the converse, you know, sort of the coming from really large classes. Like if, if, if it's a Chinese student who's coming from a class of 60 kids, um, you know, it might be sort of a, a bit of a shock in addition to the cultural changes, et cetera, the food, uh, everything. Um, even with a lot of international kids who come from large classes where they are not encouraged to participate in class, you know, those, so these are huge differences. But I think, you know, what I think everybody's going to say is that there's a lot of personal care, personal attention, and uh, everybody's able to keep an eye on the students. And if there are uh, issues, they can address them personally. No one falls through the, the cracks at schools like ours. And um, I don't see you know, persistent homesickness. I think that would be extremely rare. 
Uh, and, you know, my final thought on that is one of the reasons there's just too many things to do. I mean, you're constantly busy. You have um, a very structured environment where you have expectations and things that you have to do in terms of athletic, uh, academics, athletics, and student life. So in some ways, you, you really don't even have time to think about being homesick. And you just have such a wide and, and deep network of support that if there is homesickness, it's usually very temporary. Thank you. Well, I, I, I would second that, Mike. Um, I, I think uh, keeping students as active as possible. I mean, we are in the relationship business. I've been in boarding schools for over 20 years. And I mean, I think, uh, I think at the core of what all of our schools do um, is connect students uh, with other students, with faculty, with house parents, with coaches. Um, it is extremely hard to fall through the cracks. Um, and I also agree with you, Mike, too, that the, the first, you know, I always say that um, a student decides whether they like boarding school in the first 10 days. You know, if they're not connected and they don't have people uh, involved in their life, and they don't feel uh, good about themselves, they're probably not going to make it. Um, but I think boarding school is doing a phenomenal job of um, identifying students. They have the systems and the programs to get everyone connected. Um, and I think the, the homesickness, actually, my experience sometimes is more along the parents uh, than it is the students. Um, you know, I think it's really hard uh, at, at times for, for parents to, to let go and make that difficult decision to um, allow their, their son or daughter to be in a boarding school environment to thrive and to grow. And, um, uh, you know, so I, I think sometimes that, that occurs. Um, but you know, you you, you hit October, mid October, and, and the phone calls that used to be three times a day then become once a week, <laughs> once every two weeks, um, and and that pattern continues. So um, I, I do think probably all of our schools do that very well. I'd add that as a junior boarding school, and our our students are so much younger, our program is um, more structured than uh, secondary school. And that makes sense, right? They're younger, they need more of those guardrails to help them be successful. I'll give you an example. Our students really don't have free access to their technology. We do, um, we do lock it up. We have a cabinet in the dorm and uh, happy time is when we unlock that cabinet. Um, but we, and that helps with homesickness too because the, you know, there's six times they know and then call home. Um, and they know when they have to study and when they have to do other things on campus. So it's um, we keep them we keep them pretty busy so they don't have a lot of time to dwell on negative feelings but we also very much view it as our job to help them over you know over that hump so that they feel part of the community and that they can do it like we want them to feel from deep inside that they can do it they got it okay, um, would you have been right or if you're good uh, ditto yeah <laughs> The only thing I would add is that one of the one of the things about a boarding school that in most in most boarding schools at least and certainly in the case of LFA, the average colleague my my average faculty uh, uh, colleague will will be a teacher will be an advisor will be a coach uh, and then will be in many cases <coughs> a residential uh, uh, staff member so there's so many points of contact of different kinds with students that you know i remember when i started out at a board at a different boarding school and here i see it in such a, a powerful way uh students it's a little harder for students to get lost because they're probably going to have some adults in their lives that will be able to connect with them and see them and help bring them along moreover i think most of our schools uh, have structures in place to help students along so for example we have a prefix program here where we have about a dozen students who are uh, really just terrific student leaders who's, who are all about bringing in these younger students. We have a student council and, and, and other leadership structures that exist and our students take a big role. That's another, I think, nice part of our school that I'm very proud of is that our student leadership, you know, <laughs> I don't have to send or the dean of students often don't have to send the tough emails about behavior that's going to come from the student leadership. And, and when it comes to homesickness or when it comes to connection, uh, you know, not only do you have an adult that will probably can reach you in four or five different ways that they're gonna be working with you. Uh, you're also gonna have students who are going to dedicate themselves to connecting with 
um, with, with our younger folks. So, and then we also have constant meetings. I think all our schools probably have this, where we gather to talk about our students and see who students of concern may be and try to get an early intervention. One thing about COVID has been very humbling is, uh, you know, the, the usual ways of getting, you know, we ha we're not, we're only so op wide open in, in Illinois. So we do a masking, we do a lot of social distancing, we can't have big events, uh, it's against the law. So that's been a little harder to be new coming in and it's taken beyond Canadian Thanksgiving, I'd say for some of our students, but it's coming around, it always comes around. Uh, they'll find that connection, that kid, that student, that, that adult, that reaches them uh, and our phone calls have also started to dwindle as well. I would just say there were probably more phone calls in this period than, than we've gotten in the past uh, as a result of, again, the complexities of connecting to a community in a pandemic context. So, um, you know, I, I think all of our schools think of this as being really important. Um, and uh, as you can see, there's a lot of connective tissue in what we had to say. Um, there was one interesting question about transition. So our schools uh, and most, just about all of them, none of them start in kindergarten. So at some point, a student will have to come from one school to our schools. Uh, and in many cases, you might have some schools who are feeder schools that are nearby, maybe some of your day students, or maybe even feeder schools for, for the borders. And, and in some cases, those will be private schools. Some, some cases, they'll be public schools. How do we make sure that any student coming our way um, who has gone through the admissions process uh, is, can, can adjust? to what an independent boarding school environment feels like? Uh, and have you seen particularly any challenges uh, or how do you meet the challenges of students who maybe are coming from programs that aren't as well resourced as some of our schools are? I'll, I'll start on that. You know, so what, what we do is we have people who are actually assigned to the students and walk alongside them and help them, especially academically, um, adjust to the rigor of our school um, we also have advisory programs, and so um, with our advisory program, our students will meet um, in a small group of students um, with an advisor who will, will walk alongside them socially. And so um, if the, basically all of our new students have two points of contact, which is an academic advisor and a social advisor. Um, along with just a bunch of kids who are looking out for them. I hear that from the students all the time that, you know, people here want to see new kids and they're excited about who's joining them this year. So there's just a lot of reaching out, but even some very intentional reaching out. And of course the boarding parents at our school, boarding parents, that's all they do is boarding parent. And so they're assigned uh, 10 or so kids who are just their students. And so they just walk alongside those students for the year and make sure they're having a, every year, the new year, the first, the first year they're there or every year, just making sure they're doing well. Perfect. Anyone else in that question of uh, how we help transition students, maybe academically or personally, who are coming to our environment? Yeah, I'll come in. I think we we are ninth through twelfth grade, and uh, and and I, we pay particular attention to our curriculum in the ninth grade and our supports in the ninth grade to help students transition. Uh, you know, we we try to make it so that it's not a, a dramatic ramp onto this onto the curriculum uh, from wherever you may be. Uh, we do check-ins regularly. Um, you know, we have our, our progress reports that go out early on to identify any potential challenges. And we also have a very robust learning support program where we have students who um, work with uh, one of our, 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 our two full-time staff members to work around any challenges they may be seeing academically, let's say. Uh, occasionally, we'll also have, we'll know if students coming who may be uh, academically a little vulnerable. We have a summer program for some of our students who, that's offered before they start. Uh, and then we'll make sure to get those students some support if we feel like, you know, maybe they're a terrific student, but maybe math wasn't 100% their strongest suit. Uh, we'll know going in and have a game plan in place. And that's where, again, the adults who know the students so well comes, into hand, comes in handy. The advisors also have a very close connection and help uh, identify where the gap, gaps might be. And then we figure out as a team how to best support our students. So that's how we manage it. Um, here at LFA. Yeah, I guess I could add sort of very similar in that um, we have uh, also has an, have an advisor program and regular meetings with those students. Again, we're, you know, like we're actually this year, we're say 220 kids. Uh, we have a big brother and a big sister program. So for all the junior students who are coming in grade seven, eight, nine, they're assigned to a big brother or a big sister, an older student whose job is to check in and make sure that they're integrating well. 
um, you know, all the things for academic help, extra help. Most teachers are going to offer extra help in their subject at least one night a week. We have tutors, we have peer tutoring, and then we have a learning resource center. So every night from Sunday through Thursday, uh, you, it's not you going, you're actually assigned. So if a teacher thinks you need the extra help, you're assigned to go in and get extra help from a math or a science or an English teacher or whatever. Um, and again, we, we can manage that quite well because of the small um, student body. And I'd say it's similar for us. Um, you know, we try to be as proactive in the admission process as possible. So, you know, if there's some challenges um, that we can identify that they would need learning resources or tutoring at night, um, you know, we try to set that in place uh, as they um, as they enter. Um, even even counseling a counseling uh, component. You know, in an era where. Uh, there's a lot more mental health challenges. Um, you know, we have uh, a full-time counselor in each division. So, um, you know, we try to set that in, in place before uh, students would arrive. Um, and then I think like, uh, like all of us, we have students of concern meetings and, and uh, you know, try to, that's a weekly meeting for us. So try to identify challenges or um, plan of care, uh, you know, moving forward. So, um, yeah, that's, that's about it. Yep. You want to add or is that kind of cover it? Here's a practical question um, with only a few minutes left. Uh, are any of us taking second semester student potentially? Um, there was a question that was asked uh, if anyone's interested in joining us after the winter break, whether or not uh, there are there any schools who would consider application? We are. Mm. We are. Oh, we have room good. for one girl and one boy. Okay, so it sounds like we all are. Mm -hmm. um, I'm recognizing the time at 6:58. Um, I want to thank uh, my fellow panelists. Uh, it's been good, good connecting with all of you from all over the country, and want to wish you all continued good luck and fortune. And uh, it sounds like all your schools are really lucky to have you at the helm. And uh, it was so good to see also the connective tissue and the values that our schools share. So wishing you all the best of luck. And I want to hand it right back to Sheila from Towns. Sheila. Thank you, Jose. Well, I had, this has been so enlightening. I, I've been at TABS for just four years, but I always learn something on our Head Up School webinars. And I'm always just so impressed with the leadership of our schools. So I want to thank all of our heads of school for joining us tonight and sharing their insights and their warmth uh, with all of our families. I think as families, we can truly see that there's a 360 degree network of adult support who uh, is in place. It's a structure, it's an intentional framework to make sure that our kids thrive in our boarding schools. And we, there are terms like advisors and, and that's not something that you have down the street at a, a day school or a public school. Um, it's someone who is uh, your conduit as a parent. That's your conduit of communication to make sure that your child is doing well. And if not, they're calling you and they're talking to you on a daily basis to make sure everything is, is going smoothly. Um, so that's, that's a real differentiator. Um, and additionally, the res life portion. So the residential life. And I, I think a few people, Amy and Jose, both talked about weekends and programming. You know, at boarding school, we know ha happy kids are busy kids and we keep our kids busy. Um, so if you'd like to learn more about our schools, um, as we close here, I'll put a slide up with all of the school names and logos, but I'd love to um, inform you about Ready for More, and readyformore.com is our website where really your discovery process begins, and you're able to meet all of these amazing schools and many more on readyformore.com. You're able to search by your, your city or state. You're also able to search by a hobby or an interest, whether it's academic, athletic, or arts. Uh, so we do hope you'll visit readyformore.com and get in touch with our schools. As many have mentioned, visits are, are rare at the moment. Um, and truly, walking on a campus is the best way to find a fit for you and your family and your child. Um, when visits are restricted, as they are in some of our states and countries with COVID, please do call our admissions teams and ask a lot of questions. Talk about your child, talk about your child's strengths and weaknesses and see if it might be a good fit for you. Um, there are just so many opportunities and kinds of schools. We're sure you'll find one. So thank you again. I'm going to put up the slide of all of our schools and logos. I hope you have a great evening and we appreciate your time. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.
Good night, everybody. Good night.